Hello everybody, this is the last video, uh, which is the fourth video for the chapter 5 of statistical learning. So in this last video, what we will do is we will go back to binary classification problems, which are classification problems with two classes, 0 and 1, and then study uh, diagnostic methods to determine uh, or to assess the performance of a classification method in this context. So here let's assume we have two classes here. So the class for the ith observation uh, can be either 0 or 1. Okay. So once again here I've used yi but it could have been instead gi to represent uh, the, 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 the class. Uh, but we, we saw that uh, equivalently, when we have binary classification, it's common practice to use a numerical value of either 0 or 1. For an example, in logistic regression, to be able to tackle these problems with regression methods. So in what follows, we're going to assume that 1 represents a high-risk instance. Uh, so for example, uh, 1 corresponds that a tumor that is malignant versus 0 would be a benign tumor. So if you're in a credit, uh, the one corresponds to a borrower at high risk of default versus zero would be a lesser risk of default, or one would be a fraudulent application of credit versus zero being a non-fraudulent application. Okay, so we'll assume that zero is the low risk case and one is the high risk case. So let's say we apply a classifier on some exist data and some existing data set. Uh, we'd like to assess the performance of our classifier. So we'll uh, study two distinct tools for that. The first one is called confusion matrices. And the second one is the receiver operating uh, characteristic curve. Okay, so in short, the ROC curve, I'll say ROC because it's more much more convenient. Okay, so uh, recall last time we mentioned uh, loss functions because we, we explained that the error rate might not be a suitable metric uh, for, to, for classification when the cost related to the various types of misclassification is asymmetric. Okay, so if some types of misclassifications are more costly than others, we like to penalize them more. So what we propose instead is to use a loss function imposing a higher weight on a misclassification of high risk observations. So here, what we will do in that case, we will consider a loss function again, which assigns a loss of one when you take a benign observation or a low risk observation and you classify it as high risk, so you misclassify a low risk observation. And conversely, when we uh, misclassify a high risk observation, so if you have a high risk observation and you classify it as low risk, we're going to impose a penalty of L, where in practice L is greater than 1. Okay, So here, there's a higher cost of uh, misclassifying a high risk observation than misclassifying a low risk one. So in that case, uh, we said that when we introduce loss functions, the typical criterion to, to minimize is to minimize the expected. Uh, so for, for a given observation, when the predictors are x0, we will classify the, um, the, the observation within class small g. Is small g minimizes the falling quantity, which is the expected loss of misclassification. And in that case, the, this uh, conditional expectation is the following. So if, um, so, so uh, sorry. So, so G0 here, capital G0 is the true class. And here, small g is the class in which we classify the observation. Okay, so if we classify the observation as uh, being zero, then, the expected cost of misclassification is if we're wrong, so if we if the observation is high risk, and thus the penalty in that case would be the high risk uh, cost times the probability of misclassifying the high risk observation. 
Conversely, if we classify the observation as high risk, then the expected loss would be simply one. So the cost of misclassifying a low risk observation times the probability of having a low risk observation for that given of x, the given um, value of x. So here, if we classify an observation uh, with predictors x, x0, uh, here is the cost. So if we classify as low risk, this is the cost, the expected cost. If we classify the high as high risk, this is the expected cost. Okay, so basically, we're uh, to determine if we classify an observation as low risk or high risk, we have to compare these two quantities. Okay, so this quantity above here and this quantity here, and we, we take the smallest class. Okay, so if this guy is the smallest, we will classify as g is equal to zero. If this guy is the smallest, then we will classify as uh, g equal to one. Okay, so this is uh, what we just said. So the estimated class for our new observation with predictors x0 is class one if uh, the, 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 the probability of having a low risk observation is smaller than the probability of having a high risk observation times the associated cost or zero otherwise. Okay. So this is uh, great. This gives us our classification rule. But here there's one thing that remains unspecified, which is the cost uh, uh, of misclassifying a high risk observation. So in practice, we need to assign a cost for this. And then uh, to make these choices, we now provide the tools that can assist for that. So the first tool we're going to consider is called a confusion matrix. So a confusion matrix is a two by two table where the vertical axis represents the predicted class, whereas the horizontal axis determines the real class of an observation. And each of the observations in our trading data, uh, which are classified according to some, some classifier we, we use, will uh, be assigned to the four to one of the four following entries. Okay, so here, this is a confusion matrix. Okay, so we said that on this axis, it determines the, the class in which the observation class is classified. On this axis, it determines the real observation. Okay, so here we have a fictitious data set and classifier. So let's say we have a thousand uh, data points. So let's say we apply a classifier, then we might have the following outcome. Okay, so in the data set, there are 900 observations which were truly uh, non-risky and were classified as non-risky. There are 10 observations which were risky but were classified as non-risky. So this is the very uh, high, highly negative entry we mentioned. Okay, so these are what we call the, the, the false negatives, which are the high risk observations that were missed. Okay, so this is typically the most problematic entry in practice. Here, this is um, non-risky observations classified as risky. And here, these are risky observations classified as risky. Okay, so we see that if we sum the four entries, we indeed come up with a total of a thousand observations. So each observation was in these four um, elements. Okay, so um, in, we see that on the diagonal, we have observations that were correctly classified and off diagonal, we ha have observations that are misclassified. So here, this entry, it's, uh, we, as we said, is it's entries which are risky, but were missed. So this is the very uh, unfortunate ones. And here, this is the uh, more benign one or less risky ones that were flagged as risky. So this is still unfortunate, but uh, in practice, this is less problematic than this one. Okay, so these four entries of the table, they have names. So on the top left, uh, non-risky observations classified as non-risky, they, they are called true negatives. Okay, so it's correctly classified low risk observations. On the bottom right, we have what we call true positives, which are observations that are truly risky and classified as high risk. 
On the top right, we have what we call false negatives, which were the very problematic observations. So it's the high risk observations uh, classified as uh, non risky. And on the bottom left is the false positives, it's, which is the number of misclassified observation uh, which have a low risk. Okay, so it's low risk observations that we shouldn't be worried about, but we flag them as high risk. Okay, so as we said, the proportion of observations falling on the top right uh, corner, the false negatives, is often the more harmful. Okay, so in practice, we want, we would like to uh, reduce these. But if we reduce these too much, it means that we, we flag a lot more people as being risky and therefore the number of um, false positives also increases. Okay, so you might say, well, this is fine, but you don't want to um, increase the false positives too much because in that case, your, your classifier just becomes meaningless and there's no use for it. Okay, so the, the, what we, we want to do here is to try to find a suitable balance between the amount of false positives as false negatives and false positives. So how can we do that? Well, uh, to adjust these numbers, we can play around with the cost associated with false negatives. Okay, so when we increase L, the cost of missing risky observations, what's going to happen is because we're penalizing more intensely missing high risk observation, the classifier will flag many more uh, observations as risky. And as this happens, uh, we will uh, decrease the number of false negatives because we will miss less risky observations. But conversely, we will also increase the false positives because we'll flag many more people as risky, which were in fact really uh, not risky. Okay, so we see that uh, by increasing L, the top right entry will increase, but the top left entry will also increase at the same time. Okay, so the idea, uh, sorry, the top, uh, let's repeat that, the top right entry will decrease, but the top left entry will increase. Okay, so the idea is to try to find a, a value of L with which we're comfortable with both the top left, uh, top right, and bottom left entries. Okay, so uh, how can we do that? Well, we could do that manually, where we try vari various values of L, and based on this, we look at results, and then we we can play with that result un until we're comfortable with the the, the outputs. Uh, provided in the confusion matrix. Okay, so we, we should be uh, comfortable with both false, the number of false positives and the number of false negatives. And one uh, quick note here for those uh, who, who did some statistics, um, the proportion of false negatives uh, is analogous in practice to the type one error rate in statistics. Okay, so type one error rate is um, uh, like you're what happens if you assume the null assumption which is typically the non problematic one and uh, the the assumption should have been rejected but it isn't conversely the false positives are analogous to the type 2 error rate in statistics okay so the, this idea of false positives and false negatives it can map it can be mapped or uh, it can be seen as a uh, parallel to the type 1 and type 2 errors when we make statistical tests. Okay, so the confusion matrices are pretty uh, intuitive, let's say, so we shall not uh, spend much more time on these, but now we will discuss what we call receiver operating characteristic uh, curves. Okay, so the first thing is we're wondering when we look at that is the name. Why, why do we have such a complicated name? And the reason is that these rock curves, they come from uh, historically from communications theory. Okay, so in that theory that the name receiver operating uh, characteristic makes sense. But when we, it's used in a context outside of this communications theory, the name uh, is a bit weird. Okay, so 
for that reason we'll still uh, stick with the orig uh, original um, historical name but we we will simply call it the rock curve so people uh, we we know we don't have to repeat that very weird name often okay so when we refer to rock curve we're uh, referring to that curve so what is the rock curve the rock curve is a function which maps uh, numbers uh, real numbers between 0 and 1 to real numbers of 0 and 1 and uh, what's what's this function it plots the rates the rate of true positive observations on the y axis versus the rate of false positives on the x axis when l is varied from 0 to infinity okay so if l is equal to 0 then we would classify nobody as risky so both the rate of uh, true positives and uh, false positives would be zero conversely if l was infinity then all observations would be flagged as positive so the rate of true positives and negative uh, false sorry the true rate of true positives and false positives would both be one so then we know that when l is small we start at z the curve at zero zero and when l is uh, large the curve goes at one one and then between that as you uh, increase l between zero and infinity the curve should increase like this okay so it should be a, a we're gonna see it's a monotonous uh, curve which is piecewise uh, constant here so it's kind of a step function which starts at zero zero and finishes at one one okay so again uh, let's recall what the true positives rate and false positive rates are uh, well let's recall let's define them because we I just realized we we haven't defined these in the past so true positives are basically the true positive rate is the the uh, the ratio of true positives divided by real positives okay so it's really true positives divided by uh, so positive observations you're either true positive or false negative because if you're false negative you're a positive observation so the true positive rate is true positive divided by true positives plus false negatives conversely the false positive uh, rate is the rate of false positives divided by real negatives which is uh, false positives and real negatives it's either true negatives plus false positives okay so please again uh, the first time you read that it's a bit complicated because there's all these ratios so it, it takes a bit of time to digest so feel free to take your time pause the video go back a few slides if you're you're confused it's the the first time I, I read this I I was a bit confused and like every time I have to explain it again I have to take some time to wait and think before redigesting this material because it'd be confusing okay so don't uh, be afraid to take your time it, it's normal to be a bit confused the first time you see that okay so as we mentioned this is repeated uh, repeating what we just said but when L is equal to zero all observations are flagged as negatives okay so if you check the false positive uh, rate and the true positive rates they're both zero uh, because okay let's let's check what's the false and true positives okay so okay let us, sorry yeah so when is equal to zero all observations are classified as non-risky okay so for this reason um so sorry i'm having a, a give me one second okay so the rate of true positive if all all observations are uh, flagged as negative then there's no positive observation at all okay so both these um, two quantities will be zero 
Conversely, if L is equal to infinity, then all observations are classified as risky. Okay, so whenever your your um, the both the the false and true positive rates are equal to one. Okay, and here, as we said, as L increases from uh, zero to infinity, both the true and false positive rates increase. Okay, so this gives uh, an illustration of the rock curve. Okay, so here the dashed red curve is the identity curve, and typically for some classifier, uh, the, the rock curve works like this. Okay, so here we start at zero, zero, so this is the point where all observations are flagged as, um, as a negative. This is when all observations are flagged as positive, and then, um, so when, when you add some more penalty uh, to the, 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 the high risk observation, so high risk misclassifications, okay, so when you assign more penalty to missing the high risk observations, you will flag more people as being positive. So on one side, as you flag more people, the false positive rates will increase because uh, you'll pick up more people that, that are positive, uh, sorry, you'll flag more people as, as being positive. So in that case, among some new people you flag as positive, some will, will truly be positive, whereas some will be negative instead. Okay, so you'll increase the rate of true positives because you'll find more uh, positive people when increasing the the, the, the the penalty associated with bad observations, but you will also increase the number of uh, wrong, wrongly identified as positive people. So for that reason, this curve will increase as you increase the penalty. Okay. So uh, how do we, based on the previous curve, the rock curve, how do we assess the performance of a classifier, the binary classifier? And one a very, co a very common performance metric is the called the OROC or the area under the rock curve. Okay, so I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, OROC or something like that, but area. A stands for area, U stands for under, rock means the, the rock curve. So for a, a perfect classifier, the area under the curve would be exactly one. Okay, so if a classifier was perfect, as soon as you would, uh, class it, you would pick up a new false positive, so as soon as you increase the threshold, before hitting the next person that is uh, not, uh, that, uh, not like, okay, before flagging the next uh, non-risky case, you would have flagged all, uh, all risky cases. Okay, so the ideal classifier is that you, the, the first people that are flagged as risky are the true risky, truly risky people. So in that case, if that was the case, then as soon as you would increase the rate of false positives, then uh, it means that you've captured somebody uh, or you flag somebody as risky, which wasn't risky. Then if your classifier is perfect, it means that before that you've classified all truly risky people as risky and therefore your true positive rate should immediately skyrocket to one. So if, if that is the case, then your perfect classifier would have a curve which goes here and then continues here like this until here. So in that case, the area under the rock curve will be would be exactly one okay because here this is square one by one so the area would be one so 
This is the reason uh, why a perfect classifier has a, an area under the rock curve of 1. And conversely, if you have a classifier with absolutely no uh, predictive power, the area under the curve should be close to 0 0.5 because the curve should be close to the identity. Okay, so if your classifier is very poor then uh, and has no predictive power whatsoever, then the rock curve should revolve closely to the 0 0.5. And why is that the case? It would mean that whenever you flag, uh, so if the true positive rates follow the false positive rates, it would mean that whenever you increase the number of people you flag, every time you flag a new observation, it's as likely to be truly positive than truly negative, okay? So the true positive rates, false positive rates are the, roughly the same. So it means that when you flag somebody as risky, it's as likely to be uh, uh, truly positive or falsely positive. And in that case, it means that your classifier is not useful at all. Okay, so if you have that, then your predictive performance is very poor. So if the area under the rock curve is uh, 0 0.5, your classifier is poor. So the idea, we like to have a rock curve whose area under the curve is as large as possible. So we'd, ha we'd like the curve to be as close as possible to the top left corner here, okay? So if the curve is here, it's very bad. If the curve is like this, it's very good. And we'd like to have the curve as high as possible. So good, good uh, classifiers have this feature of providing rock curves, which are uh, pretty high and pretty close to the top left corner. So uh, one thing we have to notice here is that to calculate the area under the rock curve, well, the, the rock curve is a stepwise, uh, oh, sorry, stairs function. So kind of piecewise constant here. So the idea, to calculate the uh, area under the rock curve is simply to sum the value of each rectangles that we can form under the rock curve. Okay, so here it's written C blackboard. I'll, I'll just uh, do a quick picture. Okay, so if, okay, so let's say this is the zero one squared. Let's say the rock curve looks like this, like this, like this, and like this then this is a stairs function. So to calculate the area under that curve, we can make rectangles, whoops, uh, rectangles here, 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 and here, and then sum the area of all such rectangles. Okay, so this is the idea we're gonna use to calculate the area under the rock curve. Okay, so now, the, this is the idea. Now what we need to do is to determine what is the dimension of the various uh, rectangles in the rock curve. Okay, so what we will do now to end the, that chapter is to uh, determine the, so how to calculate the area of all such rectangles to come up with an area under the rock curve. So to do that, we will define n pause and n neg being the both the the number of real positives in our data set and the number of real negatives in our data set. Okay, so uh, NPOS are the number of observation in class one that are, uh, sorry, the, the, the number of observation that are truly in class one and N neg, the, it's the, pers the sorry, percentage, uh, the, sorry, the, number of observations that are truly negative. Let's repeat that once more because my sentence wasn't clear. So N positive is the number of observations whose real class is uh, one and N negative is the number of observations whose real class is zero. Okay, furthermore, let's uh, define the following quantity. So PJ is the estimated probability that the jth observation in the data set is equal to one. So probability of being a risky observation given the, your predictors associated with the jth observation. 
Okay, so these are not the true probabilities. They're the, the one provided by your classifier. Okay, so it can be logistic regression, can be linear discriminant, quadratic discriminant, k nearest neighbors, whatever. So you can use all these methods for classifications, which give you an estimate of the probability of being in the two classes given your predictors. So furthermore, what we will do, we'll define PPOS and PNEG being the set of ordered such probabilities and decreasing orders. Okay, so here, and that, that is unfortunate because here I've I had the, 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 I've used the letter Y, but it should be, in fact, the, the J's, okay, so the PJ's. So, sorry, I will fix that typo in uh, further iterations of the slides, but here it's, it's the set of probabilities here, not the set of responses, okay, so here PPAS represent the, the probabilities of being a risky observation for all observations that are truly risky. And here, PNEG is the set for all observations that are truly negative, the estimated probability of being positive according to the model. Okay, so, and furthermore, these probabilities and these sets, they are ordered. Okay, ordered in a decreasing order. So here, uh, the, the, the first one is the largest probability among all truly positive observations. So largest estimated probability of being risky among all true observations. And here, this is the smallest, okay? Conversely, PNEG here, this is the, the, the set of all probabilities of being risky uh, among uh, training data observations for truly negative observations. Okay, so let's give an example. Let's say we have uh, four observations. Uh, I'll use this color maybe. So let's say we have one observation, which is class one. So this is G, the class one, zero, one, zero. And here, let's say their estimated probability of being risky according to the, the, the classifier is point 8, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and okay, so here like this, like this, and here, oops, sorry, and this is, let's say, 0 0.7. So here in that case, uh, PPAS, we would check all true observations and order their probabilities as a, um, as a, uh, uh, and then increase, uh, sorry, decreasing order. So here, the, the P pause, in that case, P pause would be, so probabilities for risky observations, it's 0 0.8 and 0 0.5. So this should be 0 0.8, 0 0.5. And here, P neg, if we order these probabilities in decreasing order, this would be equal to P neg, so it would be 0 0.7 and 0 0.6. Okay, so here, I'm sorry, I, I've written Y, but these should be the, the, the P's instead, okay? But I've denoted them Y. So then, uh, in the um, rock curve, the width of each of the rectangles is exactly 1 over n neg, which is 1 over the number of truly negative observations, okay, or real negative observations. Okay, if we go back here, so every time we uh, make a step here, it means that we've added, so every time we make a step to the right, it means that we've added a new negative observation, 
So new, truly negative observation among the ones being flagged as positive. Okay, so at the beginning, there's zero. At the beginning here, we have 100% uh, of negative observations being flagged positive. But every time we make a step to the right, it means that we've added a new uh, negative observations observation among the ones flagged positive. Conversely, every time we take a step up, it means that we've added a new, uh, a new, truly positive observation among the ones flagged as positive. Okay, so as to yield a hundred percent of uh, truly positive observations yield a uh, flag as positive eventually. Okay, so because of that, the number of steps to the right is exactly uh, n negative. So the, the width of each rectangle is 1 over n negative. And just notice here that sometimes the length of the step is larger. So when we consider these as rectangles, these will not be considered a single rectangle, but instead, if there are five steps to the right, we'll consider them as five uh, five rectang rectangles of the same height for calculation purposes. Okay, so the, the number or the width of each rectangle is one over the number of truly negative observations. And conversely, the height of the jth rectangle is sj divided by uh, the n pos, which is the total number of truly positive observations in the data set. And when, recall when I say truly positive, I mean po uh, observations whose real class is positive, where sj here is defined as um, uh, the, the, the cardinality of the set of probabilities, so estimated probabilities of being risky for all positives, positive observations um, where uh, these probabilities are larger or equal to the probability associated to the jth negative observation. Okay, so this is a, a bit abstract. Let's try to make sense out of this. Okay, so here, let's go back to the rock curve. So here, let's say uh, what we do here, we do uh, the first step is up, and then right. Okay, so what? Ha okay, let, let's maybe let's forget about this and let's zoom. So let's say the rock curve. We'll pick pick any color. The rock curve looks like this. Here. Here. Okay. Here, here. Okay. So here, let's say you have one step up, one step to the right, two step ups. And let's say one step to the right. So the last one, I'll do that. Okay, so to go up here, it means that the first observation to be flagged as risky when we increase L is an observation that was truly risky. Okay, so and then the first step right means that the next observation that was flagged as risky is uh, an observation that was falsely risky. Okay, so here the length of the first rectangle is the total number of observations flagged as risky, were, which were truly risky, uh, before before uh, the first observation uh, that was not risky being flagged as risky also. Okay, so if you look at that, you had exactly, before finding the first non-risky observation and flagging it as risky, you had exactly one observation uh, which was flagged as risky. So basically, uh, what you had is you had a single uh, value of probability among the true positives one that was among the truly positive observations that was higher than the uh, probability associated to the the highest probability associated to the, the, the first non-risky observation. 
Okay, so for that reason, if before flagging the first neg uh, truly negative observation, you flag the single one, then the you have one step here. So the height of this would be of this first bar would simply be one over the uh, n positive. Okay, because your proportion of positive observations flagged before flagging the first true negative is 1 over positive. Now, let's say you do that. Let's say you have two steps up and then one step to the right. It means that before flagging the second uh, negative, uh, when I say flagging, I mean flagging as positive. Okay, so before flagging the second negative observation, you have flagged a total of three positive observations. Okay, so one, two, three. So this means that the height of this one will be three people, three true positive people over the set of all truly positive people being flagged. So here the length of the second rectangle is three over the n positive. And if you continue like that, at the end here, you flag all, all true uh, positives you flag them so the the, the proportion of uh, of true positives is simply n pos over n pos. Okay, so once again, uh, please review this very very slowly at home because now that the pace is a bit fast, but the first time you see that it can be a bit confusing. Uh, so please take your time, read that, make a, a very simple example with a few probabilities and try to, to come up uh, to, to draw the rocker for this very simple example with, let's say, six observations so that, that you can get a better understanding out of this. Okay, so now uh, from that, we have that the width of each rectangle in the, the rock curve is one over the number of truly negative observations, whereas the height of the jth rectangle is sj divided by n pos, where sj is defined uh, as this. Okay, so um, I use uh, y neck j, but maybe I should have used p, so, but it, it's fine. It's just an alternative notation, but it just, we, uh, if we use that notation, y is not the response variable, it's really the, the, the ordered probability among all negative observations. Okay, so because the, the, the width is 1 over n neg and the height is sj over n pos, then if we want to calculate the area under the rock curve, it's simply the sum of all rectangles, which is 1 over n neg. So we said the width was 1 over n neg. And if we, uh, so n neg and negative, and if we sum across all rectangles, it's become this times f s j times the height and pause, which gives uh, exactly here. And here the j's, they're sum across all uh, truly negative observations, so j goes from one to n neg. Okay, so this gives uh, the way to calculate the area under the rock curve. And the higher the area under the rock curve, the better the performance of the model is. Okay, so when, when we come up with various classifiers, uh, we, we like to have the highest possible area under the rock curve. And one thing that is interesting about the rock curve is uh, it's a way to visualize the performance for all possible values of L, the penalty associated with the um, uh, high, high risk misclassification for all L's simultaneously. Okay, because each um, the 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 each, each step here they correspond to val various values of L in the rock curve. So it, it's a way to visualize results for all all L simultaneously. Okay, so in a sense, it prevents uh, from trying various L's to assess the performance. You just look at the common for performance for all else uh, at once. So this completes the chapter. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you next time for uh, the, the, the chapter six. Take care.